present as a 75-year-old retiree. Be honest. Ow! Ow! Oh. Ow! Charlie, no, 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 no. Ow! I believe the clinical term is dust balls. Hello, everyone. This is And Just Like That, The Writer's Room, the official companion podcast from Max. I'm Michael Patrick King, writer, director, and executive producer of And Just Like That. And I'm here with executive producer and writer Julie Rottenberg. Hi. Executive producer and writer Elisa Zaritsky. Hello. And writer and consulting producer Susan Fales Hill. Hello. We're really happy to be here, especially to talk about this episode, which is episode four Alive. Exclamation point. Now, we haven't really relied on an actual piece of punctuation in a title since Sex and the City, single and fabulous, question, question mark. mark. Right. Now, this episode was written by Julie Rottenberg and Elisa Zaritsky. And why is the exclamation point important? Mm. Well... Assuming we've all seen the episode. Right. Do you if you want haven't to... seen the episode, you're going about to be a big bummer. So please turn it off because we're <laughs> going to spoil like crazy over the next period of time. So please turn it off and come back and hear us when you're done. So as you all know, because you've seen the episode, the exclamation point is there because Enid, Candace Bergen's character, named her new magazine for retired Ladies, women um, of a certain women age. Women of a certain they age. They don't have to be retired. They have to be true, of a certain age. True. I just fell right into the trap that Carrie <laughs> fell into. Which is why we wrote the episode. <laughs> People have issues around aging. But the vivant, which is French for alive, as she said in the episode, which did not make it into the actual cut on television, is uh, vivant with an exclamation point because sometimes you need to shout. Well, and it's a nice counter to the narrative of the invisibility of the older woman. This is something we hear about all the time. I'm invisible. I'm invisible. I don't know if it's because construction workers are no longer whistling at one, but it's fantastic that this character is seizing her power in this moment to es say, we're here. Especially since before we wrote this and while we were writing it, Martha Stewart had not yet been on the cover of Sports Illustrated. It wasn't this enormous, like, 80 is the new 60. When we were in the fields writing this episode, what we were trying to explore was the idea of Carrie and her concept of who she is in the world now, age-wise. And the ambivalence that I think all of us have about age and aging, right? Like I think of myself, I have friends in their 70s. I enjoy learning from people who have walked, you know, ahead of me. I, I enjoy that in life. Yet at the same time, if I were mistaken for someone 10 years older than myself, I would no doubt be a little ruffled by that. So I think we're ch we were trying to walk that line with Carrie. Too. And also, how old do you really think you are? And the first cream pie, which we call cream pie, is when somebody gets a joke at their expense put right into their face, is when Enid is sitting across from Carrie. By the way, Enid, Candace Bergen's character, has always been spiky and icy. So we wanted a storyline that would be similar to her personality, which is kind of always to throw Carrie a little bit out of a comfort zone. This idea... Enid invites Carrie to a magazine party for something called Vivant. The reason Carrie went to Vivant is to push her book. Yes. And the idea we wanted to explore was this very internalized prejudice that Carrie has, and I think we all probably are guilty of Especially having. Especially when Elise is out with her older, older friends and join their friends. company. <laughs> um, but as Elise By the way, I'm one many. of them, so I can speak for that. <laughs> and, and compared to us, she's a fetus, <laughs> let's face it, by the new map. Um, <sighs> as we get older, I mean, hey, we wouldn't have come back with And Just Like That if we didn't feel like women uh, in their 50s had a lot of exciting adventures right. to tell. But this was our way of acknowledging that as we get older, there are always people a little bit older than you are that you can assure yourself, well, I'm not that yet. And that right. was what we wanted right. to. Well, it's also interesting because historically in this series, 
Candace was always a step above her, both in authority and experience and sophistication. And the one time that the Candace character is including her, she's basically right, right, saying, right. girl, you right. old. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's a drive-by. Yes. But, but she's unaware that she's just Al capone Carrie at breakfast and just said, you're old. And the other line, the reaction that's funny to take with you into the next scene is when Carrie meets up with Seema and says, do I present? <laughs> Which is one of my favorite lines that you guys wrote. As a 75-year-old. <laughs> do I present as a 75-year-old? And the idea that Seema says she wishes you were in her group, she's a senior, we're sophomores. And I think there's always a constant, like, we're still in high school, and that's a double entendre about senior citizens, senior in high school, we're sophomores. It's just people really don't know their age. They know how they feel. And the thing about age that's important to Anne just like that is that society. That's the wall right. we're trying to break down. Much like in Sex and the City, it was single people need to be married. They're the lepers. We had to break that societal mm -hmm. world down like, hey, maybe being single is not bad. And now it's, hey, maybe being 50s or 60s or 70s in Enid's case is not bad either. Yeah, or maybe 80s and up, it's a la bad. Gloria Steinem. Can we take a moment Let's talk to about talk Gloria. about Gloria? Well, first of all, to be clear, when we wrote this episode, Gloria Steinem was the dream. So in between the uh, f season one and season two, before we even started writing season two, I was invited to an event, a, a, an intimate discussion about menopause, and lo and behold, Gloria Steinem was the featured. Uh, it it, it Hosting, was actually right? at Cl Gloria Steinem's townhouse in her parlor. So naturally, I was beyond excited to attend, and it was a fabulous event. And I couldn't wait to tell my colleagues all about the conversation, which. Which, by the way, was very tied in with Vivant because even though menopause was the conduit, was kind of the conduit, mm. it, it really did open up into a conversation about aging and all of our misconceptions and all of the brainwashing around sort of clicked together. And the holy grail the was. Ho and, and, and the dream was Gloria. maybe, maybe, maybe Gloria Steinem would deign to be in our little show. And she did show up, and it was amazing. Oh, my God. And the interesting so thing exciting. about the journey of the episode was how do we make this many things? How do we make this authentic to Gloria? And by the way, Gloria's speech is Gloria. That is, 100%. That is her talking <laughs> without a script. I said where you don't have to say what's written here. You know what it is. Now just talk about aging. Oh, my God. <laughs> so maybe the new frontier is aging. So this is our new frontier, and you are it, folks. Okay. We live longer than men, which we don't mean to do. <laughs> There's spontaneity in her conversation that was in that room with all those ladies. We were there for th two or three Hours. days yeah. um, um, doing that scene with all those wonderful women in that room, and there was energy that was exciting. Sarah Jessica was excited. Candace, Candace was excited. You have Candace Bergen. Gloria Steinem, Sarah Jessica, Julie Halston, and then all those other women. And it really felt a little alive. bit. Alive. It really <laughs> did feel alive. Exclamation and, point. And, jazz and I'm going to say that every take, because, of course, we did many, many takes, Gloria would say different things. I mean, she would give a different version of her point of view of yeah. womanhood and aging and the world. I mean, it was – and COVID, there were – she just had so much to say right at the tip well, of her tongue. And then was... you created that beautiful moment where she absolves Carrie of her ageism and, and says we're all the age we think we are in our heads. And, and you know, she says we're our minds, not our wombs, mm -hmm. which was very important. And then yes. there was the, you know, 
this the reverence we all have for Gloria and for Candace. And I remember because Michael, you were directing, we were all gathered on that second level. And we knew Gloria was, she had just arrived on set. We were told, you know, through the walkie-talkies, she's arrived and she was coming up on the elevator and we were all waiting with all the extras and the doors opened and she walked out and we were all so (laughs) nervous and excited. And she (laughs) laughed because it was like as if we had planned a surprise party for her. Um, But so you have that high level of reverence and then the ridiculous of the dick pic. The so, dick pic. That's us. Like, <laughs> but that's us. We're you go to ch- You yes. go to church and you laugh. I mean, we have Bitsy there thinking she's going to help Carrie move because in the episode before, she was so moved by Carrie. They had that beautiful scene in the nail salon. So this time, again, a funny thing about aging is who do you think you should be with? And uh, of a show born of dating, Carrie's single. So all of a sudden she's getting this silver fox sent to her in a yellow sweater. And she's like, what is this? This little thin runner that then pays off when Bitsy sends her a dick pic. And I have to tell you, it was quite a dick pic search. Because <laughs> it had to be, as Bitsy said, as you the, can imagine. the human <laughs> tripod. Job, somebody had to be had the, to do it. It had to be the human tripod and it had to be gray. So... That's the that's the real holy grail, really. Gloria was easy compared to that. So but, you think you've got dick pic was the show that we well, helped just take. the idea. That, and you know, I did Murphy Brown with Candace. That was my first television show, and she has a wicked, wicked sense of humor. And the idea that she was game for holding a phone that was suddenly going to turn into a dick pic. It was so funny. And at one point, Sarah Jessica was so nervous that Gloria would see the dick pic. Oh, my God. We were all That she was trying to hide it because it wasn't supposed to happen. (laughs) Well, you just wanted to protect Gloria. And then it popped on the phone by accident. And all three of them went, oh, oh, hello. Oh, my God. (laughs) I think it's so important that this show reclaims sexuality for women of a certain age. Because you're not dead, your libido doesn't go anywhere suddenly after you start to have be in menopause. And I think the fact that this show celebrates women saying, I had a great time, that Bitsy is saying, wait till you try this one. It's and also if I could gray go, heat is a good thing. <laughs> I, I also think to take it one step further, it's important to show that there's humor around sexuality still too at this age, that it is not a closed case, that we're still laughing at how you can be embarrassed by overt sexuality in a public place, which mm-hmm. is which is right on our whole thing, like making fun of sex. Yep. And you can be a little juvenile, right? Like you're still an adolescent. You're still just, sure. Bitsy is Winking in her and- mind. She is 17 years old. The same person she was but in the backseat of that Thunderbird. Yeah. That's what Carrie is like. Says to yeah. Gloria, I, 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 "We're the age of our minds." So you know, it's like, how old are you? It's very an interesting question to ask anybody. What do you think? How old do you think you are when you close your right. eyes? And this episode oddly has a very sexual thread through the whole entire episode. We can go right next to Charlotte and Harry. Mm-hmm. Charlotte and Harry, and what we have come to call Casper the Friendly Come. Now, can we talk for a minute about the one storyline from Sex and the City that was on... The hanging chad. The, 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 <laughs> probably on that whiteboard, whiteboard from 25 20 years, years ago. ago. Not 25, 20, was probably the only thing we didn't... We never found we a story for it that we, we thought We wrote was... it down. We thought it was funny. Casper the Friendly And the come. story was a guy who came but didn't come. And that we always thought, that's hilarious. And we, especially when we tagged it, Casper the Friendly Come. <laughs> and so finally <laughs> this year we were like... Is this Casper the Friendly Come? It's an idea come? whose time has come. <laughs> Literally. And it's the idea of as you age, your seminal fluid can decrease. It can go away. It depends. This is the man talking. Um, it can go away depending on something. And also at a certain age, the storyline really starts with Harry and Charlotte and LTW and Herbert's kids going away to summer camp, which is an idyllic state for the parents. Yes. It's like you have free time. If I may, (laughs) Um, I have a thing or two to say on this topic. My children, who I love dearly, if they're listening, um, (laughs) they would go to summer camp every summer. And I realized not only was it this 
in, it, it was like being a kid again as a parent because we're like, woohoo, we're free. But I realized. Which actually is written into the script. <laughs> <laughs> woohoo, we're free. If you have any understanding of why writers write, it's to express That's something it. they like again. So, woohoo, oh. we're free. What are you guys going to do with all your kid free time? Oh. Work. Kinky. But no kids, no interruptions. And now that my film is in Tribeca, I have a zillion polishes and clearances I can do without any guilt. I've got a huge backlog of pro bono things I want to mm. dive into. You too? Yeah. Um... Things <laughs> we're behind on, too. And I realized uh, after a few summers of experiencing this that I was nicer and more in love with my husband. I, I just, everything, I, I was, I was more patient with strangers. I was like, after you, <laughs> like I, I wasn't racing home. I wasn't worrying about a hundred different things. So, and suddenly this man who I've been married to for a long time with, with just us, it was like a whole new thrilling well, adventure. Because the little dirty secret, and we all adore our children, is that they do suck the marrow out of the romance of a marriage because you are just consumed with the minutia of day to day. And so to see these two sets of parents say, oh my goodness, I get to look at you and not discuss the orthodontist bill. Orthodontist bills are not sexy. Yes. So, And we really wanted that moment. And there's another scene that you've never really seen because they wouldn't put it in the script, no matter how much I, the showrunner, <laughs> kept saying, shouldn't we see Rock and Lily away at camp? Oh, and yeah. you kept oh, going, yeah. no, no we so. don't need to see them. I, I, I kept saying, isn't there the a fictional. phone call between the parents <laughs> and the child and the parents? We've kept, never by the way, I don't, I don't have kids. <laughs> so I kept reaching for yeah. that phone call. Like, shouldn't they say, like, I want to come I, home? And you're like, I, Elise and I were like, no. I am, still, <laughs> I am still personally mystified by why you wanted that so badly. Oh, because they're characters in the <laughs> show. So and I so thought true. it would show a little bit of a tear. At this point, I would like to suggest that all three of you tell your kids not to listen to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> this would be the moment when I would yeah, say this, this is... one to avoid. Oh, we didn't record episode four. Anyway, <laughs> let's get into how amazing Kristen Davis and Evan Handler are in these scenes, which were not easy. I was directing them. In order to do any sexual content now, there has to be an enormous amount of discussion. Right, an intimacy rightly so, coordinator. An intimacy coordinator, and everything must be put on paper. The first thing is, Harry, Charlotte says, do you want to come on my tits? <laughs> now, for somebody who has written Charlotte for so long, <laughs> to see this couple where Charlotte has no boundaries yeah. or shame about sex, to see that develop is so thrilling considering where she started out in Sex and the City. And I think the first time we ever cracked that wall in Sex and the City was on Tukas Lingus, Lingus, where they were talking about some Another man. Elisa Zaritsky yeah. specialty. Uh, and Charlotte says, <laughs> Kids are definitely like, not listening to this podcast. <laughs> Trey likes it. And then and defends then herself. everyone so, looks at her. And she says, we're married. we're married. Like it was allowed because they were married. Anyway, so the first thing was we had to get that to happen. So in order to do that act, I had to create blocks for Evan to stand on over Charlotte. And Kristen's like, so what's happening? I said, just just throw your head back like you just love it and just do it. And she's like, okay. And it's all written out and it's great. And they're hilarious. And the scene afterwards, which is, I think, one of the very few times where Sarah Jessica really added words. Oh, this is my favorite. Are you talking about jizz, jizz, jizz? jizz yes. Jizz. Okay. So jizz. I still you have jizz. to break it down for I me. have to I just have to say I will personally own that I I think the word jizz is one of the funniest words ever invented. <laughs> and when I typed it into the script, I was hoping and hoping and hoping, praying that Sarah Jessica who is a lady and who has standards and sometimes doesn't Unlike like to go down into the gutter. For Carrie. For Carrie. 
yes, she has standards, and I respect her she standards. She sees Carrie as above the yes. common sexuality. So I was like praying, pray, pray, praying that she would, that this would pass her funny bone. Her funny bone. And I think it's safe to say <laughs> it did. <laughs> and so when we were at the table shooting that coffee shop scene, and she decided on her own to milk the shit out of that <laughs> word and say it three, four, four, times. four times, I I fell more deeply in love with Sarah Jessica than I've ever <laughs> than I, I ever have been before and didn't even thought possible. So And you know what's interesting? In that scene, Carrie says to Charlotte, I've never loved you more. Mm. When she's talking <laughs> about loving the fire the come and the mm. fireworks and the fourth of July. I've never loved you more. Well, so, I, I actually have never loved Charlotte more because it is a beautiful demonstration of the work of marriage. Yeah. And a lot yes. of shows take you to the altar. It's not the, right. the, what the hell did I do afterwards? And this is, it's a very real and yet romantic storyline. Yes. And she was so in the moment when we were shooting that sex scene. So I, does I, I really, I, again, I agree. I was and so when in the love with her. Well, the confetti return, <laughs> well, the confetti returns is, I have to say, a director <laughs> moment for me. Because I realized, well, if they're having sex and the confetti returns and he's in signer. How does she know? Perceive it, it's right? Not, it's not. It's not a Nancy Drew in the missing spelunking. You know, like <laughs> right. who spunking. has time? For, like who right. has time to discover that? So on the morning when you know I'm going in to direct the scene, I've done all my work before I come in because it goes fast, and I say, Kristen, I think it's a hand job, and she goes, What? I say, <laughs> I think it's a hand job below frame so that you can just glance down, and she goes. Oh, and I said, you're just saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, why you're giving me a hand job. And the intimacy quarter goes, I don't think I can get a hand job cleared legally <laughs> by 10 o'clock. I don't have the paperwork for a hand job. And I said, well, get the get the paperwork going because it's going to be writing because oh it's going to be a hand job and Kristen just is like, okay, and it's so lovely. It's charming. It's charming. And the other thing that we wanted to explore, you know, we're, when you have bunch of characters. You want to explore where they're different and different sides of New York and the lifestyle of these different people that know each other. So it was really important for Susan and all of us to show another side of LTW and Herbert. And Susan kept talking about a night on the town. Mm. Yeah, that's, again, one of the bonuses of not having the children around when they go away to sleepaway camp is rediscovering each other as a couple and to see this beautiful African-American couple getting dressed up for each other, not for anyone else. And they end up at the beautiful bar at the Mark. Yeah. And it's gorgeous. And when I see it, it's really like Nick and Nora Charles. It's like a 1930s and they're just sitting there and they just, the reoccurring gag is without the kids, with the kids away, how much they love each other, but the elegance and the magic of them and, of course, there's a little tiny homework in there because we have to introduce the, the, the storyline, the, the, the very complicated storyline that Herbert may or may not be running for office because we want to show a new depth to a character. So we're constantly, as the joy of a series, of writing a series, you get to accordion out some of these people. And once you get to a certain number of episodes, you're like, okay, now we know who they are. Now who else are they? Mm. So it's all of a sudden like Herbert wants to do well for the city ever since the cab incident. He knows that the city needs work and he's also a philanthropist in his head. He makes money, he wants to give back and they have the kids. So how do we do this? And we wanted to give them a special episode, which was this 20th anniversary party. Yep. And so that's a moment to look back at your marriage and where you are. And one of the things we talked about is their theme and through line for the season was dueling dreams. And you have LTW, who, of course, is a very hands-on mother, but is very much committed to her work as a filmmaker. And Herbert, obviously, is committed to his career and wants to do more. Yes. Now, this story, LTW and Herbert's anniversary party, is yet another storyline that Elisa and I let's just say, wrestled to the ground because originally there was one idea, which was that Herbert, we were going to reveal that Herbert was running for office 
but that LTW was the last to know about it. There was another version where... This was a journey. It, this it, was, it, it was a, and the journey, journey. The journey is all focused around what would be exciting and what's climactic and what makes a dinner party special. And uh, to me, I think the most important thing, and I believe it was you, Ms. Zuritsky, cracked that L- it had to be LTW's idea that if we felt like she was either cowed into it or um, surprised by him or the put upon wife who who finds out he's really running. You know, we didn't want to do that. We wanted her to sink herself. We so, wanted and her I think to the be the cha- one. I just want to say the challenge is how do we show another side to a relationship, another dynamic? And we've seen we've seen the Wexleys kind of bicker with each other about Wait, we didn't your, want the bicker uh, we, we didn't want to keep going to the well of he's taking her for granted she's not you right. know so it's it's always like we know where we want to land but how can we get there in a new well, way and this uh episode excitingly by bringing in the in-laws it shows that they are actually like every married couple in a mixed marriage because right. even if you marry into the same ethnicity the other families invariably not like yours. And in their case, Herbert comes from Southern aristocracy, very proper, very polite, you know, generations of Morehouse. And uh, LTW is from a more bohemian and eclectic background. We're going to keep her mommy a secret, but her father is a brilliant playwright and artist and very much a leftist. And so since this is the writing room, we can talk a little bit about, as as Elisa says, we know where we want to end. But the reality is in this extravagant dinner party, not only do we have to show somehow a comic scenario where LTW throws herself in front of the campaign, <laughs> even after she, Herbert says, I don't want to do it, the gen- genesis of the dinner party was, I mean, and this is really how a writing room works, if you're vigilant, was that there were 40 people, elegant friends and people there. And then we realized we already did that dinner party. In episode yes. four, four last, last, last year. year. So right. we're like, we can't do that again. But what's the this hook? This was after the table read, guys. I just want everyone to understand. It was, Normally we, the table read is like the last you're stop always, on the You're always looking. You train. have to constantly say, but it's not there. It wasn't right there. yet. It wasn't it's right. It's not funny it yet. Land. What's the funny thing that happens at a dinner party that we're cutting to this extravagant dinner party? And since we knew it was extravagant, we thought the funniest thing would be if there were only five people at a 40. No and the disaster <laughs> is that Eunice, who is Herbert's mother, and Lawrence, who is LTW's dad, are oil and water. They can't stand each other. And so they had thought with 40 people, it's going to be fine. Right, the and it's the worst possible scenario. I also want to say that this scene completely thrills me because in it is the exploration of dueling visions of Black advancement. Mm. You have Eunice, who represents the talented 10th. <laughs> You're as bourgeois as they come. Right. And you have Lawrence, who is fight the power, anti-capitalist. I'm an artist. My playwriting and my little theater in Newark are my weapons. And, uh, and then you have another duality, which is the other version of what a woman is, which is Eunice saying, I baked the right. cakes myself and I was happy to do it <laughs> because it made my husband's business flourish. My priorities <laughs> changed. changed. Well, she, I gave up my brilliant career, career. as a concert And pianist. then LTW is down there arguing for, I love it. she even says, and, and Nicole is so amazing because she's actually yelling down the table, well, things are different now. And mm-hmm. her voice is cracking and then her father defends her. By the way, I just have to say the idea of Eunice being seated so far away from everyone else because of the air conditioner on the day. We had written that into the script. That was what we all agreed on. On the day when I saw the table for 40 huge the table was and Eunice sitting all the way over there. And I said to Elisa, isn't that a little insane? And Elisa said, Jewel, think about your mom. (laughs) <laughs> Would your mom be not sitting there if that were the warmest seat in the room? And suddenly I was like, oh, you're right. You're absolutely right. Well, she and I just looked there. at it like, well, without that, you don't have anything. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm just a comedy whore director. I'm like, 
somebody sitting down at, and then Harry and and Evan. Evan has minimal <laughs> words, dutiful, but maximal oh, impact. So I mean, good. the way he's putting his hand on his head and do I have to go back? And and the other fun thing about that uh, party to me is you see Herbert and um, oh, Harry. And he says, I feel like we're more we're than dad, dad friends. friends. Yeah, right? me too. And then it's good. I sat you next to my mother. <laughs> but the point is, we're seeing these people sort of in their own two legs, not as attachments, not as side dishes, but as the main course. Mm -hmm. And then you have Chris Jackson, who, you know. Oh, my God. Look, Chris Jackson and Nicole have chemistry. And just to see that sort of give and take between them and one defending the other and just and, that beauty well, of that. And their families driving them together. Yeah. And so they become a united front against their parents. I also have to just name check a few people. I was so obviously overjoyed to have Billy D. Williams, who is an old oh family God. friend and a legend, legend. But he also stands for so many extraordinary, dignified men like the Harry Belafontes of the world and Douglas Turner Ward and Gordon Parks. These just incredibly elegant artists and heartthrobs, I must say. Okay, moving on from the Wexleys, let's get to Miranda's storyline, which is another very familiar family in crisis. We've gone from a family we're just meeting to a family we've known for many years. And, uh, and another, another, another destination we knew we wanted to get to, but then had to figure out the route to well, getting to this a three, is really to important. the three way. This is really important. How do you react to critical jabberwocking? after last season. Like, what's the stuff you let in? What's the stuff you let out? What let in that really bugged me was that Steve, that we, the writing staff, had reduced Steve to a feeble old victim. And that was Because upsetting. he was sort of thrown and ex passively accepting the shock of what Miranda was telling him. So now we get to come back. And the first thing I knew, what you must do as a staff is sh defy the criticism. So we're like, we're bringing Steve back, not as a victim and not old. So I called up Steve, David, David and I said, David, get a speed bag and get into shape, because the first time the audience is seeing feeble old Steve, <laughs> who's deaf, he'll be ripped, sweaty, hitting a speed bag. And he's like, he I'm it. on it. <laughs> and he, and I mean, that is the yes, thrill for me. you had that image from yeah. the beginning I of was the just like, oh, really? Like... And there'll be a lot of that in the upcoming season. In a couple, but oh, really, that's what you think. Well, here's what we think. People have moments where they're thrown. And I thought it'd be interesting rather than collapse any further if Steve got angry. And the only way to get rid of the anger was to exercise. So here we have Miranda finally returned to New York City. Finally. It took us three episodes. Right. That we loved her Garden of Eden with the snake and the poison and all the stuff that happened to her in L.A. But now she's back. And what would her life be? She's not in his bed because she's filled with guilt. So she has to be on the couch because she wants to be close to her sad son. So we but it's start... a self-imposed exile. exile. Yes. Yeah. But where else is she going to go? And that's exactly where she should be at that point if she wants to be around, again, the kids, which I have to say, in all of your defense, the flip side of your characters are, get those kids away from me. And I will protect my kids till the end of time. All three of you have a complete split in your personalities. You hear that, kids? It's, <laughs> you can turn Mama it's true. Would you can turn the, in front of a train. For it's true. Your, when it came when it came to Miranda leaving L.A. because Brady said something borderline dangerous, and her mom alarm went off so much so that she came home. And she could have blown up the whole relationship. She didn't because yeah. they sort of she forced a let's not end like this moment. But anyway, the point is she comes home because of Brady, so she'd be in that house, and you see her the first time on the couch <laughs> hearing the speed bag. And what I also love is if you look very closely, she's reading Carrie's book. But the reality is, so you see Steve, and he's ripped, and you see this family, and Miranda's got a smiley face on, but she's in hell. Now, I wonder if justice for Steve people will feel that He's just, just that, that image of him memory. is 
just as well, it's, it, it, I mean, well, it, it is a rocky is. moment. It is. It's I mean. a rocky moment, but there's... Are you <laughs> happy, guys? Well, but No, but listen, it's important no, that I David... Know. That we show that David is a vibrant I, human being. Uh, wholeheartedly. Oh, so and he a, looks amazing. Hot. Yeah. Um, and I want to say, for me, Miranda... She's sleeping on the sofa, which means she's not sleeping much. The fact that she's still doing her job as a mom, which is knock, 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 Brady, we have therapy. He's being uh, a jerk as as Spoken only as a mother. often are. I would say uh, petulant nice and word. annoyed. Oh, I was, <laughs> was going to say kind asshole. of a dick. <laughs> I was going to say asshole. Okay, I feel better. Um, but she's still on it, you know, to making sure everyone's going to be at the right place at the right time. But she's punishing herself, really, for what she's done. Yes, which is important because Miranda is feeling a lot. Once you jump off a cliff, you have to go, what did I do? Well, th and this, mm -hmm. That brings me to therapy, family therapy. Mm. For those of you who've never been in family therapy, it's rather <laughs> painful. <laughs> um, so I root hear, canal um, would be preferable. Yes, actually, actually, it is up there with root canal. Um, but we wanted to show that Miranda and Steve care deeply about their kid. They're willing to put their own stuff aside. They're going to do the right thing. Uh, in our minds, they they got him into therapy. They dealt with it. But, of course, we know and Brady knows it's not that simple. And so this session turns into more of a what's going on with you guys. Right. Brady pulls it together and says, you two are a mess and you're not helping me. Mm -hmm. So in that moment, uh, the therapist steps in and says, we should think of a more permanent solution than living in the house. So Steve says... I'll get a place. And Miranda is very surprised, surprised and touched. Yes. And then the, the bottom. And relieved, I think, and secretly then, relieved. And then the drop kick to the whole scene is anything else. And Brady says, I don't want to go to college. And Miranda's silent. The important thing in the scene is looking at Miranda's performance in this scene. The good mother, the guilty one, the quiet one. The censored one. She is self-censoring through this entire scene. Even Brady says, "Really, mom? We yeah. can all see your heads she's about to explode." Herself. She's right. she's trying to be good, and she's actually performing the part of, "I'm not the problem." Yeah. Well, the to the therapist, selfless. Yeah, yeah, the selfless. selfless and one. I have to uh, applaud Molly yet again. Even the costume choice. She's in this almost Molly 1950s housewife dress. I mean, she is. Pulled together. Pulled together. Mm -hmm. And it's the not woman me. holding it in. And I'm doing my she's best. She's proper. Yeah. And that has what it has, what's called a smash cut. The next thing in a writing term is a smash cut, where you go from one sentence to the next one. When I it's have a, nothing, nothing to, to say. say. I have so much that's to just, say. That's a smash Words, cut. Words Miranda and, has and, and never And since it's the writing room, said. it would say smash cut two, and we yes. use it rarely, but it means hard cut, don't get fancy. It's the two <laughs> sentences right next to each other that are the joke. And we see Carrie and Miranda going to change new apartment. This is the first scene we have Carrie and uh, Miranda mm, in, in the, the entire room. season. They've been on the phone, but that mm, right. do, little tiny hallway where she says, it's a contract we made. Yeah. I'm. He's not allowed to punch me in the face and I'm not allowed to take any more room up than the couch. That's pure Miranda. That's raw. There's no cushion on that. And then Carrie says, that sounds healthy. <laughs> you know, what else is she going to say? And yeah. then they have, we have another surprise, of course, in the episode, which is they open the door and Lyle is there. Oliver Hudson. Oliver Hudson is Lyle. And one, one of the great joys of being a writer is that you can, if you like something, you, you can, can have more. You can have more of it. <laughs> and we thought, how can we complicate Miranda's <laughs> expectations? She's thinking I'm going to have this night of love with Che in my new place at Hudson Yards. A deliberate choice, by the way, we made to take Che from ratty old Hell's, Hell's Kitchen, Kitchen. five-floor walk-up to this modern. antiseptic, modern, literally... Deluxe apartment in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally a catalog. We looked up Hudson... Yards Apartments, went to the real estate page, gave it to Miguel, the designer, and Karen, and said, do this. And it's exactly, you can almost smell the air conditioning. 
when the door opens, yeah. you smell that, that process. That building has and, amenities. <laughs> yes. And uh, so, and it was like, the, everybody was like, it's so bland. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, that's the point. That's it's the prefab mm-hmm. success. Mm-hmm. So anyway, Miranda and Carrie show up and they're thrown, especially Miranda, because Lyle is there. We like the idea of exploring who Che was before Miranda met them. And then we wanted to explore him and we made Lyle a Beverly Hills hairdresser and that into, into Isis Carey, like, what do you know? And they begin to o- unwrap Che before Che, which was long Carrie Underwood hair, stand-up comic, uh, Lovely funny Latina, Latina, Latina ladies, ladies, stand-up. And then they get into the piece de resistance for us, which is the bed. We broke the couch. So yeah, there was nowhere else to, to go sure that, but the bed. Yes. They all had to land on the bed. Also, we circled this so many different ways. We really didn't want it to be like Lyle's there and Miranda's mad. <laughs> and also, it's like they, Sada, Cynthia, and Oliver, it's like they're such grown-ups and they, they were going to play it there. We knew we couldn't make some false... Conflict. But may I bring people into the, the strap on rides again? <laughs> oh. Or does it? <laughs> the original idea was in the, you jumped ahead to the th- three way. I don't blame you. It's exciting. Um, <laughs> uh-huh. The original idea for this episode was once Carrie leaves, Oliver falls asleep because he's been drinking and he's a lightweight. We Lyle. just contrived Ly- Lyle falls asleep as Oliver. Oliver falls asleep as Lyle. It's just the whole crazy DNA spiral of who is who. But anyway, they, he falls asleep, so they're in bed together. And Elise had this great sort of through line about, this is like when I was in college oh, and my right. roommate. Because when you look at them, they're really in a dorm room. Right. When they're, they're yes. having like drinks on in solo cups, we made sure Che had no... So it looked as most like a college as possible. And you cut from that very fancy dinner party to them in a dorm with red Solo cups eating uh, Ikea treats. And then we wanted to get them in bed together so that in the middle of the night, something could happen. And in terms of the strap-on that both Elisa and Julie (laughs) went on another uh, crusade about getting out of the show was at one point, Miranda, in the middle of the three-way, was going to get so threatened that she stood up and tried to also have a dick. So she went to the corner and got out a box and got the strap on on and sort of came over. So instead, we just referenced it and found... Sorry, guys. Charlie Horse. <laughs> no, I know no you more. wanted to see it again. Um, well, I think <laughs> what, what we were trying to do, and it makes me love Miranda, is she's being herself with Che. She says in that scene when they're on the bed... When they're talking about thank you for asking strap-ons and stuff like that, she says, "Like I believe at the time I was home cutting up carrot carrots sticks for, Brady. for mm-hmm. Brady." It's like she's 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 in there, right? She's not pretending to be someone she's not, which is why in the three-way we knew it had to be it had to be sexy and funny. And the consent piece was very right. important. Are you okay with this? Thank you for asking. I need to think about this for a minute because my visceral reaction is no, but maybe that's just fear of the unknown because, I mean, how will I ever know unless I try it? We're all here. It's kind of hot. It's getting less hot the more you talk. Sada is so appropriate when it comes to things of any sort of a sexual nature, a human being. So she's they're always checking in with everyone on the set to make sure everybody's comfortable. Oliver was from L.A. and amazing and so supportive (laughs) that there was a whole conversation beforehand. So it's interesting that Sada, as Che, says, are you okay with this? Which is something that is so true to Sada. And we wanted to also make sure, I think like when it started becoming funny, at least to us, was when we all realized we didn't want it to be the trope of the guy being like, hey, let's have a (laughs) three-way. Like, we didn't want that You put that in the show. He says this isn't some pervy. Yes. And And then it was like the next level was what would... Any of us, like if we were put in, if I, I will personally say I've never been involved in a three-way, but if I, if it were put to me, 
what would I actually say? And so it, it's like putting Miranda, real Miranda, real us in almost an etiquette uh, <laughs> <laughs> dilemma. Is it was, rude to yes, turn down the that three-way? That seems that was, that was where funny. it became And funny. then when it actually became the physicality of the three-way, it turns into the Charlie horse because Cynthia Miranda decides to top both of them somehow by climbing on top and of Jay so and just, cute. I guess, and fucking them both. And then she gets a Charlie horse. I like that Miranda, it, even though she's back in New York, she's spread her wings. She's and her legs. done. She's and her spread legs. all the things. Um, <laughs> what she has. And she's dropped her old, you know, she's dropped all the, the you know, Rules. rules and laws and blah, blah. like I like that she is still kicking the tires of her of her boundaries and her sexuality and feeling out what am I you know it I, I didn't think I would do a three way but maybe I, it's kind of hot you well, know and, and we mm -hmm, we love Che for coming and joining her on the couch yes. that when we landed on that that felt so right because that's the humanity of Che. And, and I want to. I also want to shout out to uh, Sam Irby for helping that little piece of the puzzle fall into place for us. Well, Sam Irby and all of us help everybody's yes, little puzzle. Yes. I mean, there's no such thing as just one person writing this show, especially no. in this writing room. It's all yeah. everybody's points of view and everybody's different interests and everybody's three ways that yes. they've had. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the other thing, so the other funny thing about the final moment of Carrie in this is I'm out. And that, that, and that great entry, line, why am I still here? Why right? am I still here? And the fact of the matter is Carrie's in this entire episode is really pushing to see who she is now which is the whole sort of arc of Carrie for season two is just like, who am I now? What is my life now? Where do I fit? And Vivant, we all know they're all alive. We tried to create a very alive episode and we did everything from giant guest stars to big three ways to even brought in a cartoon character in a new way, <laughs> Casper. And typical of the last moment of everything, we get to see where Carrie is in the last moment of Vivant is her throne and trying to use Dear PayPal. In headlines. You know, and we're going to continue to see Carrie thrown in recover and throwing thrown in recover. Throwing money at the problem. And throwing money at the problem. <laughs> and it's all about growth. What we put in front of people then becomes their storylines. And not just Carrie, all the characters that this season will be following and hopefully following their growth and their changes as well. And just like that, this is the end of episode four. Thanks, Elisa, Julie, and Susan. We'll be back next week to unpack episode five of the series, Trick or Treat. Stream new episodes of And Just Like That Thursdays on Max. Listen to the podcast on Max and wherever you listen to your podcasts. And Just Like That, The Writer's Room is produced by Neon Hum Media for Max. At Neon Hum, Cher Morris is the executive producer. Joanna Clay is the lead producer. Sammy Allison is our head of production. Zoe Culkin is our associate producer. Sam Baer is our engineer. That's it for the show. Thank you for listening. <laughs>